Uh, I wanted, first of all, uh, even before I start giving you another programmatic sort of a talk before we get into the real science, to uh, first of all uh, thank INSEEK for the Michael. wonderful Michael. for the wonderful uh, introduction that. Uh, for the wonderful introduction he gave with the uh, story of how this uh, workshop came about. And it's important to, to remember this as part of the entire scene of the, of the Keto Climate Variability Research. And then, of course, before I run into a time crunch to thank uh, a few of the, of the people who were extremely instrumental in, in putting this together, beginning with INSEEK, uh, going to the local organization committee with Fred and particularly Anna, who. Uh, on top of also of organizing the activities of uh, the Cliver activities on that subject, also put together this workshop. And without these kinds of helps, we, we would not be at this uh, wonderful place and, and the ability to uh, get uh, the science together and, and inspire uh, future activities. Also, of course, to thank the, the uh, ICTP for providing this place. Uh, I think one of the best places to organize a meeting of this kind from previous experience. So it, it was a real joy to know that this place would be able to host this kind of a meeting. So uh, without much uh, further ado, I'd like to tell you an additional story about how Clivar got into this uh, interesting activity and lay out some uh, ideas of what we are expecting from, to come out from, from this workshop. Uh, sorry, I also would like to thank the speakers who agreed so nicely to come out here and to give, give their, their view of the cadaver variability and of course to all the audience here for making the trip and coming. And so sorry for the people who could not, we could not host here. Hopefully they are watching us now uh, on the uh, special electronic uh, facilities that were provided by the organizers here. So, thanks, everybody. Um, decadal variability is a long interest of, of the uh, community, of the research community. And uh, uh, I can remember workshops of, of all kinds and symposia of all kinds that were happening starting in the uh, 1980s, 1990s, uh, with interest in decadal variability. Um, this has been going uh, on for a long time, so the question is, what are we doing here right now? So bef before that, I wanted to say, what, are we, what do we mean by decadal variability? Why are we so interested in that? And what are the impacts on, on uh, people's lives? And this is just a, a short list of examples of what we encountered in the last uh, 50 years or so in terms of changes that have a long time scale that uh, cause climate shifts or climate variability, depending how you are looking at it. And we'll have some more about the, uh, whether, whether we, are, we are talking about the same thing when we are saying shift and when, when we are saying variability or not. Um, the Sahel droughts, the big change in the Sahel that happened in the 1970s, which was a devastating uh, event for, for Africa, for sub-Saharan Africa. And we still don't completely understand exactly how this thing happened and whether anthropogenic influences were involved or whether it was a natural variability of the sort we can expect more in the future. Um, tropical cyclone activity in the Atlantic. Um, researchers on the, uh, already in the 1980s have pointed out at big decadal changes that occur in frequency of storms, intensity of storms in the tropical Atlantic, which have a, has a huge impact on population, in, uh, especially in the Western uh, part of the Atlantic uh, Basin on, in Central America, in uh, North America. Um, so that's another decadal phenomenon uh, that is still debated about what the origins exactly are. Everybody knows sea surface temperatures are involved, but how do these sea surface temperature anomal anomalies get created? Um, the Mediterranean drying trend, I mean, we are in the Mediterranean now, and countries in the Mediterranean, all the way from uh, the, the west to the east, especially along the northern rim, experienced a very long protracted drought. And fingers have been pointing at the North Atlantic Oscillation, but 
okay, the North Atlantic Oscillation is an atmospheric phenomenon. Why does it present such exhibits, such long time scales? Uh, we still don't know. Um, droughts in the Southwest US, a lot of work has been done on that, and you will hear a couple of talks uh, about the uh, origins uh, of the drought in, in the oceans and so on. Still, why do the oceans exhibit this kind of variability? Can we predict this sort of variability? Um, and more recently, this surprising hiatus, an unfortunate name that uh, a lot of uh, uh, climate scientists and also uh, people who, who explain this phenomenon to the media don't, don't particularly like because it, it suggests that something has happened that we couldn't expect. But people did expect changes of that kind. And nobody thought that global warming is just a continuous, simple increase towards the future without any effect of natural variability. And uh, the recent drought in California. So all, all these phenomena last several years and, of course, affect decades. And we don't completely understand why. So that, uh, just in terms of um, a figure that shows that, I, I, I picked up two figures here. One, the top one shows, it, it's all based on models, but we can show similar uh, results for observations for the, for the 100, 150 year observation record that we have. The top figure shows a, fa a figure that uh, George Bohr already uh, presented uh, year, a couple, couple decades ago, actually, in uh, showing the ratio between variability on timescales longer than 10 years, or, uh, on periods longer than 10 years, to total uh, in, uh, interannual, total variability measured based on annual data. So it's the ratio between fast changing climate, the climate system, and the slow changing climate system. And you can see that there are regions where the, the colors are red, where the decadal variability is very strong, compared to the total variability. We, we notice things like that in the, in the northern ocean basins. Um, in the, 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 the very blue color in the tropical Pacific shows that decadal variability doesn't stand out above the strong El Nino phenomenon, but it's still, despite that, if you only examine the decadal spectrum, you still see that there is very strong decadal variability even in the tropical Pacific with a lot of implication, which we will talk about later in the conference. Um, the bottom figure is an attempt to show the ratio between decadal variability and the anthropogenic climate trend. In other words, uh, using so, sort of uh, linear uh, techniques, you can separate using the models, using a, a large ensemble of models, you can separate between the model response to anthropogenic greenhouse forcing and volcanoes and aerosols. You can separate that from the natural variability that occurs in the models. And what you get is there is the result shown below that in the tropical belt, uh, anthropogenic variability dominates, while in the northern oceans where decadal variability is very strong, the natural variability dominates. And of course, so, so we do have to understand both in order to uh, predict the future. This is all for the 20th century, uh, based on the, on the signal, on the relatively weak signal, the anthropogenic signal in, in the century. So, <laughs> Another slide that shows, okay, why are we interested in it all of a sudden? Why the renewed interest now? And as Insik described, from different directions, there is a increasing in interest in the phenomenon. And at least for, for a, a few of these reasons, that are, that they are not all the reasons, but some of the reasons that we can uh, uh, point at, is the fact that we have new instrumental observations, particularly the Argo observations in the oceans, that tell us much more than we ever could uh, observe in the oceans. We have observations from space uh, that, uh, of the kind that is giving us more and more information, quantitative information on the planet. We also have the CMIP-5 attempt to predict uh, future variability. Uh, the decadal prediction effort started under CMIP-5, and it shows some successes, which we need to understand further. But it also showed some disappointments, where we, can, we were not able to uh, create skill based on initial conditions from the oceans. And the question is why? Why are the difference between places where we have some success, why in other places we don't, and why we still don't have good success in, in doing uh, the predictions over the land where people are actually living? 
Uh, and then the, the hiatus that I already mentioned. And on the paleo side, we have a tremendous new rich uh, attempt to uh, reconstruct climate variability on a, on a multi-century multi timescale for the last thousand or even two thousand years, which give us on an annual basis, which give us a lot of information on decadal variability. And we can learn much more about the natural system and how it uh, be <coughs> behaves from that. And the, uh, also under CMIP-5, there were uh, uh, several uh, modeling centers that joined the effort to uh, create long decadal, multi-decadal century and, and millennia timescale uh, runs or simulations in which they superimpose the, what we know about solar variability, volcanic variability, land, land use changes to see how natural either forcing, external forcing or, or internal variability affects the climate system. And those two together can help us learn more and provide more, more information to the science scientific group and of course to the public about the cattle variability. So th these are reasons for why all of a sudden there is renewed interest and we should pick up those things and go forward with these new uh, observations and modeling attempts to understand better the, the phenomena that, of the cattle vari vari variability. So Clivar uh, was for a long term interested in decay variation. Actually, from the, or from the origination of Clivar, decay variability was one of the reasons for, the, for, the, uh, for this effort. Uh, after Toga, the famous attempt to understand the Pacific, Clivar was created with a focus on decay variability. Clivar, this is an organization diagram that can, you can find on the Clivar website, and essentially shows that Clivar works on two different levels. One level is the regional panels and, and modeling panels, which is all the way here on the left. And the other is cross-cutting activities that cut across the, the interests of each different um, panel and tries to bring key problems in the, in the climate uh, science and to, to the forefront, creating uh, cross-cutting activity and uh, decadal climate variability and predictability is one of these efforts uh, that was blessed, quote unquote, in a meeting in The Hague about a year and a half ago uh, in the Pan Cliver meeting. So m several of you were, or many of you were there. So th this is how it comes into Cliver with the idea, with these kind of like broad objectives that are listed, listed here to characterize the decadal variability, to understand it better, to understand its predictability. These are all goals that are, we have, as I said before, new tools to try to understand them and, and address them to a different level. Um, and of course, to eventually capitalize on the understanding to bring information to the public, who is very much in the present day interested in uh, decadal variability uh, facing the changes like sea level rise, which is quite obvious in many places, that create much more danger to coastal regions, even if the storms don't, don't, themselves don't change. Other extremes that have plagued the planet, are those extremes natural or the anthropogenic? All these things the public is very interested in and is beginning to act uh, in a way to prepare for a difficult f a future to, to many of the world's populations. Um, I'm going to skip these slides for just the uh, sake of uh, uh, time so we can move on. And I'm going to just say that to address these, these problems, Cliver created a so, sort of ad hoc working group. Uh, many of the p members of this working group are here, and we will meet later this week to essentially uh, put together a lot of the things that we prepared before, but mostly things that we are learning in this conference to propose to Cliver an action plan forward, the science and how to implement it. So for this reason, we are looking to help from the participants of this workshop and from the discussion, from the presentations and discussions that we are going to have to have to have to hear. First of all, to gain from meeting and talking about the subject and, and learning from the most recent science on the subject. The second thing is to make an effort to identify in, a, in as much a precise manner the, the obstacles 
that, that are facing us. So the more we, the scientist group, are able to define precisely what we want to um, address and how do we want to prioritize this list of obstacles that we want to address, the more we will be able to gain support from funding agencies, from the public, to be able to continue to do this kind of research. We, we have to strive not to be vague, but to be precise about what we want to, to achieve. Um, and uh, also, to, in order to start action, action on the subject, to identify existing uh, efforts on the subject that we can invigorate and, and uh, learn from, and to suggest new ways in which we, which don't exist at the moment, to learn more about how to address decay variability. So thanks everybody again for deciding to come to these meetings. Thanks for everybody who helped organize it. And I'm looking forward for a very exciting, exhausting week in front of us. Thank you very much. <laughs>